This is the Lightning Podcast, a show dedicated to inspiring God's people and anyone else who might be listening to read, study, and meditate on God's Word, the Bible. I'm your host, Podcast Jones. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm Adam Casalino. And we have been looking through the book of 1 Samuel for quite some time. If you're new to the podcast or you're just kind of jumping in here or there, feel free to check out the older episodes. We've been going through every chapter of the book of 1 Samuel. Now we're on the second to last chapter. Last episode, we looked at the beginning of the chapter where David and his men had to go and fight these people called the Amalekites to capture back their families and all the spoils. David rescues everyone. No one's lost. They get all the spoils back. It's amazing. And now we're at the point where they're returning back home to this city called Ziklag. And this is what happens next. This is 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 21 and 22. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Bezor Valley. They came out to meet David and the men were with them. And David and his men approached and asked them how they were. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, Because they didn't go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each may take his wife and children and go. Okay, so if you remember from the beginning of chapter 30, that David had 600 soldiers That was his entire force, and they were marching out, rushing out to find the men who destroyed their city and took all their families and all the good stuff. But 200 of those men stopped at a brook in the Bezor Valley because they were too tired to follow. So only David and 400 men actually went out to defeat what would have been thousand or more Malachites, and they defeated them completely and brought back the families and spoils. But now we see that there's a group of men who did fight who are refusing to share the spoils with the men who are left behind. Now maybe to you that might sound fair. These guys gave up when things were tough, right? They didn't go out and fight and get their brothers' backs. So why should they get anything from the spoils? That is a very human, fleshly reasoning that says, I did all the work so I get to keep everything. Why should I share with someone who didn't? But the reality is, these men are overlooking quite a bit. And what does the Bible call them? (laughs) They were evil men and troublemakers. These weren't fair and honest men of faith who honor God's word. They don't have generous hearts. They might not even consider these other men, men that they fought with and lived with for years, as brothers even though they were all Israelites, so technically, yeah, they were brothers. But let's think about the men who stayed back. The Bible doesn't call them cowards. They didn't run away when the fighting got toughest. They were simply too exhausted. Let's keep in mind what has just happened in the life of these men and David. Just recently, they had been fighting with David for a long time, protecting Ziklag and protecting the region around. So these were brave warriors who had fought quite a bit. And even more recently, they went with David, all 600, to march with Akish in battle against Israel, even though they didn't want to. And they had to turn around and and march a ride back after Akish says, go away. They were with David when they returned to Ziklag and discovered the city was destroyed. And they rode out with David to find the men who did this. These weren't cowards. These weren't people fleeing from the battle. They simply ran out of stamina, not willingness. Yet these evil men are slandering their character and denying them what's rightfully theirs. These men were evil because these spoils originally belonged to these other men, but were stolen by the Amalekites. Now, maybe if these soldiers went out and raided someone else and took new plunder, they could potentially have an argument and say, well, I'm not going to share it with men who didn't fight with me. But in this case, they were attempting to rob these men of their own possessions, which was the very thing the Amalekites did. So how does David reply? We see that in the next few verses, verses 23 through 25. David replies, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. 
He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute and ordinance for Israel from that day to this. So David refuses to allow these men to rob their brothers of the spoils. And notice how wisely David acts. He reminds these men that it was the Lord who gave them his victory. They were able to defeat thousands of hardened warriors, just 400 men on their own. Clearly God was with them. And let's remember who these men were at the very start. This is what, this, these weren't the cream of the crop of Israel who were with David at this point. These men were the same miserable, pathetic losers who came to David when he was living in the cave. These men had nothing to their name, and they were going to David for help. It was David who trained them, equipped them, and turned them into very brave warriors. Yet they seem to have learned nothing from David when it comes to the Lord and character and, and spiritual truth. Remember, it was kindness. Kindness they didn't deserve that led David to welcome them into his ranks. And it was kindness from God that clearly allowed them to defeat a much larger enemy. Yet these men refused to show that same kindness to their brothers who were just too weak to ride with them. And notice David also reminds them that the men who stayed back weren't being lazy or cowardly. They were guarding the supplies that they left behind. These 400 men were marching off into a fight, so they couldn't hold on to all the supplies or tents or animals or anything else they had brought with them. There was stuff that they had to obviously leave back as they quickly rushed forward the final miles to get to the battle. So these 200 men weren't just sitting around picking their <laughs> belly buttons. They had to keep all that stuff safe and guard it if another group of people show up and want to take it or maybe even wild animals. So they were doing work. And David, by doing this, he's also hearkening back a very commandment from the Lord. In Numbers 31, 27, the Lord commands that Israel's warriors were to share the spoils with everyone back in Israel. So these men were wrong on, on numerous counts. And they were evil, according to Scripture, because they were just disobeying God's commands. Now let's look at this from a different angle. Some people might say, this is, this is the Bible endorsing socialism and communism. You see, the idea that we need to share our wealth with those less fortunate. And I've heard many people in the world, people who conveniently don't believe in God, trying to endorse this type of system based on passages like this and others. And the reality is the Bible does urge the rich to share with those in need. But that's not some uh, secular system called socialism or communism. That's just being generous and kind. The entire Bible calls on those with means, with wealth, to look after the needy. That's in the Old Testament in the law. It's very explicit. And in the New Testament, Jesus says just as much. And in the apostles and, and the rest of the New Testament also talk about that. But that's not socialism. Socialism or communism, because those are pretty much interchangeable, is an economic and political system where the government takes your wealth and distributes it to those it thinks are more deserving. It's a system driven by greed and assumptions of hate against different political or social groups. In America, it's racial groups. And that's just for starters. It's also a system that elevates the government above God and denies citizens their basic human rights. There's nothing in scripture that supports that kind of evil system, especially when you consider that most famous socialists throughout history hated religion and denied people their religious rights. But this story brings up an important question that we may have overlooked in the midst of trying to explain what's going on. This is David, the mighty man of God, yet there were evil men marching with him. So we might think, how is that possible? How could there be evil people and amidst David's army, this was the man after God's own heart. He's literally writing psalms during this time that end up in the Bible. Okay, talk about a godly man. How can he have evil people in his midst? Is David allowing these, these evil men to work with him? What's going on? Well, let's keep in mind even Jesus had evil men in his inner circle. 
Judas, one of his chosen 12 apostles, we know betrayed Jesus, which led to his arrest and crucifixion. But Jesus knew full well from the beginning that Judas was going to betray him. But he chose him anyway because that was a part of God's plan of redemption. Now with David, he might not have known these men were evil. It could have been this very moment when they revealed their true colors. Or it's possible, like Jesus, David knew, but he kept these people around. We're not sure, but here's something that we need to <laughs> keep in mind in this situation. All of us are evil. All of us had pursued sinful lives in direct violation of God's word. None of us, based on our own nature or merits, is truly good by biblical standards. Most people think, well, I'm a pretty good person, but by whose standard? They often will point to other people and say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. But according to God's standard, his word, all of us have fallen short. All of us are sinful. And whether you admit this or not, all of us, because we're sinners, are capable, if the circumstances led to it, of betraying our own mothers. Don't pretend like that's not true. Now, perhaps you grew up in a church where you were taught that if you do what the Bible tells you to do, that makes you a good person. And because you are a good person, God is going to love you and bless you, and you'll even go to heaven when you die. But I hate to shatter this illusion. Actually, I don't hate to do it at all. I love doing this. That is not what the Bible teaches. Every human being, apart from Christ himself, was born a sinner. You were born a sinner. I was born a sinner. And we have lived lives in rebellion to what God says. And the Bible teaches us no amount of good works can earn for us God's approval. You could try your whole life, but it'll not work. But instead, God has provided a much better way through his son, Jesus Christ. The good news is Jesus died for our sins and he rose again to give us new life. So if you want to be right with God... It's not about doing good works. It's about believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you believe in him, God will forgive you of your sins. And this is what we call grace. When we believe in Jesus, he transforms us from the inside out. We go from being evil people to people who are forgiven. And the book of John says we are children of God. And we become people who love God and want to obey him. This is not something you can do yourself. You may have grown up in church and tried so hard to follow all the rules, but that's not what makes you a good child of God. Only God can do that when we believe in Jesus and ask him for his forgiveness. And believe it or not, that was true even in David's time. Christ had not yet come at this point in history, but God did receive anyone who believed in him. The Old Testament says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's the Old Testament where it says the righteous person or the good person will live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in God. Faith in his word. People who had faith in God, even back then, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and believed in what his word said, were accepted by him. Despite being evil, God changed them from the inside out too. So we could assume these evil men were evil because they never received God by faith. They had heard about God from David, of course, but their hearts were never changed by God. And that becomes evident based on what they were doing here. Now notice how wisely David acts in this moment. It's very different from what we've seen from King Saul, right? There have been many episodes in 1 Samuel where Saul bowed to the pressure of people. He may have given in to these evil men if he had been here, saying, okay, you keep the spoils, we'll just de deny these men what belongs to them. So once again, we see the contrast in this passage between David, who is someone who has faith in God and wants to obey God, and someone like Saul, who despite having faith in God, was putting men before God's word. And then we see in that passage, David prevails, and he makes sure the men get their spoils. But he's not done acting wisely. 
We see the end of chapter 30, verses 26 through 31. When David reached Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, Here is a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. David sent it to those who were in Bethel, Ramoth, Negev, and Jatir, to those in Aror, Sifmoth, Eshtimoa, and Rachel, to those in the towns of the Jehoramalites and the Kenites, to those in Horma, Bor Ashan, Athak, and Hebron, and to those in all the other places where he and his men had roamed. That's quite a few places, quite a few cities and regions in Judah. So what's David doing here right now is making strategic moves to secure his relationships with folks back in Israel, specifically in the very large region of Judah, which was his own tribe. Now, if we look ahead, we'll find out just how important these decisions were, even though David doesn't know what's going to happen next. But what he's doing, he's giving back portions of the spoils that were taken from Judah. If you remember, the Egyptian slave that they find, who had been serving the Amalekites, told David that the army had taken plunder not just from Ziklag and from places around it, but actually in regions in Judah. So David's doing the right thing here by giving back some of the spoils to those men, to their people, to their land. And when we say spoils, it's, it's wealth in the form of animals, fine garments, perhaps wine and grains and all this good stuff, perhaps even gold and silver in the form of coins and, and money, but even um, fine implements. Scripture says these men were David's friends. In fact, they were probably leaders in the regions David and his men had previously lived in when they were guarding the shepherds in the southern regions of Judah. This is back when he had that confrontation with Nabal. And of course, this also serves to ensure the leaders of Judah that David has not defected to the Philistines. We know these elders were friendly to David, but they might have gotten worried when they learned he fled the land and was serving Achish, which was the king of the Philistines. But now David sends them these gifts with the encouraging message And that's going to reaffirm to these men David's commitment to his people and his faith in God. Because remember, he says these are the spoils of the Lord. So he's not worshiping Baal or the false gods of the Philistines. He's still loyal. He's not sending spoils, by the way, to Achish. He's sending them to Judah. And this is going to serve him well, because in a matter of days, he's actually going to return to the land. But as I said, David didn't know what was going to happen next. He's acting strategically, as I explained, but he doesn't know what's going to happen soon. He's simply doing this because he knows it's the right thing. His conscience and what God has taught him from the word is leading him to do this by giving these spoils to the men who had lost some. So this is where good works do come in, but not to earn God's favor. The people of this world do quote-unquote good things, hoping to get something in return. It's unfortunately very rare in our society where people do something good for nothing. Folks even give it to charity because it's tax-deductible. And some people give, and sometimes give a lot, hoping to receive praise or feel better about themselves. But followers of Christ are not called to do good things so others can see it or praise them. Jesus even said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Like that's how much we should not try to make a big deal about our good deeds. We do good and show kindness even to those who are ungrateful because we know it's the right thing to do. Our consciences have been purified and transformed by the Lord and his word. So we do what is right not to get a reward from people, but because we want to honor the Lord. Doing good doesn't earn us a currency, so to speak, with God. Doing good isn't about getting a seat at the table in heaven. You can't earn your way to heaven, nor can you earn brownie points with God because you did something good. As I said, we are saved because Jesus Christ died for us and rose again. He's freely forgiven us of our sins when we believe in him. That is why the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. And once we're saved, God begins an amazing work transforming us from the inside out. This is what we often call sanctification. 
We are growing in our faith, becoming more like Christ in his character. We could put it this way. God is changing our hearts and minds. Our desires begin to change. Our attitudes begin to change. We start to see the world as God sees it. And we begin to care about the things God cares about. This is not something we do ourselves. This is a work of God. He puts something in our hearts that makes us more like him. It's called the love of God. The Holy Spirit in Romans 5 says he pours the love of God into our hearts. And that love makes us more like Christ. Paul writes in Galatians, it's the love of Christ that compels us to do the good work that he does. It's that very love that drives us to serve others and do good because it's the right thing to do. Not because anyone is making us do it. And notice the sharp contrast between David and these evil men. Those men wanted to keep all the spoils, even the stuff that belonged to men who couldn't fight. But David gave away a portion of his spoils to men in a completely different land, who not only didn't fight, but didn't even know there was a battle going on. Why did he do this? Because God had so transformed David's heart that he wanted to do it, to bless his brothers in Judah with this gift. This is what happens when we walk with God. He changes us. We don't change ourselves. We don't do good to get something from God. God is the one who enables us to do good in the first place. And he blesses us for no other reason but because of what Jesus did on our behalf on the cross. He doesn't bless us because we read our Bibles or we said our prayers or we're good little Christians. He blesses us because we have the grace of God made available through Jesus' perfect finished work. So doing good is a fruit, an outcome of this blessed relationship we have with God. It's not the source of that relationship. So David acts wisely and blesses Judah. But what's going on with Saul? We heard that the Philistines were marching to war. Well, we're coming to the end of 1 Samuel, and we're about to discover the fate of Israel's first king. Thank you for listening to the Lightning Podcast. You can find every episode of our podcast available on all major podcast platforms. See you next time.